our, our next session is a joint act from Nigeria. I'll do a brief introduction. We have Daniel Ishaya Dabo. He's from Kaduna State in Northwest Nigeria. He holds postgraduate diploma in civil engineering and an MSc in quantity surveying with commercial management. Daniel has worked as a lecturer with Kaduna Polytechnic for almost 15 years and has very good working knowledge in land surveying and is a member of the African Task Force Federation in International Surveys. He's passionate about securing just distribution of nature's capital and he's a member of several advocacy groups on land right issues and justice in equitable allocation and use of nature's capital. So if you'd like to come up and then our, our second speaker with him is uh, Luca Bulus Achi is from Kaduna State in Northwest Nigeria and holds a BSc and an MSc in Urban and Regional Planning. I'm delighted to see a planner here. Uh, he uh, worked as a lecturer for over 25 years as General Manager of the Kaduna State Environmental Protection Agency, important work, and as Director of Parks and Recreation Services in the Federal Capital. And he's now a consultant with uh, in, in Vicons in uh, Ab Abuja and a pioneering member uh, of for this work. Please welcome our friends from Nigeria. Morning, everyone. Uh, let me start by saying uh, the last time we did a presentation on land value tax, someone asked a question, what has a quantity survey got to do with land? It was supposed to be on the construction site. Actually, I got my motivation after reading the economic classic from uh, the 17th century economic writer, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nation. And since I begin to develop my interest on how land resource could be used for the benefit of the general masses, and that's when I went into today papers, we are just going to highlight what's happening about land in two areas, mostly in uh, northwest Nigeria, Kaduna State, and the federal capital. I actually brought in my colleague. I was wondering whether Elena will allow him to have his own separate time. But I brought him because we started the work together and he's been an inspiration to me. He has moved higher on the ladder than I do. Uh, can I get the first slides? First, let's have a general setting. The, we know Nigeria being the largest or the populous black nation on earth. Every one out of five person is considered a black person is considered to be a Nigerian. We are about two, 160 million. That's as of uh, UN projection for 2009. The last census we had was uh, 2006, and they put our population at 150 million. We run t three tiers of government. We have federal, states, and the local government. We are signatories to almost all ed consents, as long as there is any convention, whether in the Hick, Geneva, and whatever, Nigeria always have signed. But unfortunately, we have over 200 environmental laws with some local flavors. The enforcement has always been pitfalls. The laws exist, but you, they never get enforced. The state has overall C in land matters, according to an act passed in 1976. Everything that concerns land is a state government. You know, we have both federal and the local government existing, but the state government has a final say. Okay, the next slide. Background on land tenure. Uh, before the colonial masters came in, we used our customary and cultural land tenure system was used. It was nothing written. It was just derived from chiefs and traditional leaders. Uh, sometimes you just get a parcel of land given to you by a neighbor, sometimes with for not exchange and verbally, weakness have been registered and what? There is a weakness, two weakness concerning the issuance of land. It is settled by the chief and uh, I think we were comfortable before the Britons come. Between 1914 and 1916, colonial system and customary land tenure run concurrently. 
we had the Irish conflict, of course, the European uh, had upper hand, and there were land that was designated as European quarters, and you, you are never allowed to go in. They were fully controlled by the colonial masters. Between 1960 and 76, same as above, but customary land tenure restrict, was restricted to rural areas. You cannot exercise, uh, bring in customary <coughs> land tenure within a developed area or within a city. Government could acquire land at will, anywhere, and give statutory certificate of occupancy. Uh, between 1976 uh, to date, the Land Use Decree Act 1978 was passed. It provided all land to be vested in the office of the governor and to be managed in the interest of the public. Uh, compulsory acquisition was introduced to enhance development, customary rights to be provided by local government on rural land only. We had multiple crises with uh, the administration of land from chiefs and traditional leaders as a result of uh, some corrupt influences. And the Act now vests the authority for custom, uh, customary rights to the local government. Uh, can I have next slide? The challenges created is that temporary structured unit planning permits, and by definition of temporary structures are structures that do not have a concrete or steel. And so that creates its own challenge because you could uh, develop with wood, and I was wondering, been in Europe for two years, uh, a large chunk of the structure could be considered temporary in Europe. <laughs> because uh, they, they neither have steel or concrete. And person less than 21 years cannot own right uh, over land. That also had its own because when a breadwinner passed away and there is none uh, out of his uh, biological children that is up to 21, they automatically lost the right to that land. The statutory certificate of occupancy has more recognition than any other uh, right over land. That also is a serious challenge because uh, I could go to a rural area, just mark out an area, apply for a certificate of occupancy, and once it is issued, I could lay check to evict anyone on that land without recourse to the origin of the land as long as I hold a certificate of occupancy over that land. The process for a certificate of occupancy is quite expensive and cumbersome. In most cases, you pay more for the certificate than the actual value of the land. And so that keeps the very poor or less privileged out of the whole game. There is always discrimination against uh, settlers and migrants. Uh, because Nigeria is made up of over 200 ethnic groups, if you, are, if you don't belong to the local ethnic group, you hardly get right over any land along such quarter, except if you are highly pleased or influential. Tenure for land use for a certificate owner is 99 years, and unfortunately for a non-certificate owner, you don't have tenure. By one day notice, you could be evicted over a land you have lived or your ancestors have lived for so long. These are the challenges. And uh, sorry, I didn't mention women are still discriminated against, even though there is a law now that uh, women should be allowed to own land, but the silent discrimination still exists. So once a woman lost her husband, is uh, she's likely going to lose the right over the family land, except there is a male that is up to 21 years in that family. Now I have the next. Case study one is Kaduna Metropolis, is the fourth largest city in Nigeria, well planned by Lord Lugard. It was a center for the colonial administration in the north, so it has uh, land use systems in place. Regarded as the political center, gateway city to most northern states, because of its uh, planning and infrastructure, it became the major gateway city. A lot of people coming to the north from other parts of Nigeria had to pass through Kaduna because it is well planned, it has infrastructure, it is very close to the federal capital. Availability of infrastructure also makes it a choice place to live outside the federal capital in the north. Basically, it's the largest, uh, best 
place to live in the northern part of Nigeria. Rapid development in the southern part towards Abuja because Abuja became so expensive to live. A lot of people live in Kaduna and travel the about 180 kilometers uh, distance to the city center, center to walk every day and come back. But unfortunately, we've been ravaged by over 50 Teen religious and political crisis from the 80s till date. Uh, recently, those of us who know about the crisis of Boko Haram in Nigeria, it's still going on. But the, about eight weeks ago, the federal government declared state of emergency in three states and it has died down for the meantime. So, by this religious crisis, it's actually impacted uh, how land. It's been administered and used in Kaduna states. Can I have the next slide? The first thing it did is uh, created a social and a cultural differential in access to land. Security and safety become paramount in land acquisition. A lot of people shifted. You, you have to live among your peers to be safe. If not, overnight you could get killed and your landed property could be taken over you. And uh, we, the most unfortunate thing is there's a river transversing the whole state. And so one <coughs> section moved to the south of the river, the other stays up north of the river. And uh, the north is actually planned, unlike the south, which wasn't planned. The thing resulted to land extortion. If uh, during the crisis you lo lost a breadwinner, you could be ejected by someone, by a neighbor who you had lived uh, for so long with, could just eject you and claim ownership over the land. And uh, you have to run because your life is uh, more important than land. <laughs> land holding and land grabbing became major. A lot of uh, people who are influential or who has money go along where development is likely going to be and acquire thousands of hectares of land. And uh, believe me, they make quite a lot of money overnight. You could acquire land for less than the value of, uh, let's say, for less than 2,000 pounds. And in less than a year, they could make approximately 50 to 100,000 pounds on just that piece of land they just acquired. Because the pressure was on security and everyone was moving. And people could sell, out the, uh, sell their asset and move. The rich have all. They use their money and position to acquire land, get title, and eject original owner. Because of the challenges, all they need is get the land, demarcate it, and apply for the certificate of occupancy. And the following day, you're being ejected for land that uh, you inherited from your parent who so. This influenced the formation of a group called Initiative for the Support and Promotion of Human Settlement. Uh, me and uh, Luca Chi here are pioneer members of this group, and we have started to work, even though it has been quite challenging and we have received quite some threats in the past. But uh, in our own little way, we have just managed to impact the few people we can. Can I get the next slide? So, we view land as a common gift to all mankind, irrespective of race, religion, gender, or social economic status. That's uh, based our fundamental uh, look on land. So far in Kaduna, we have uh, successfully handled 19 cases of such land uh, extortion from the less privileged. It we are settled amicably through negotiation. Uh, this we are basically people who had lost their breadwinner with the meal in the family and unfortunately they didn't have a meal to take over land. And such people were ejected from their land and we took up the keys. And uh, on the merit of our argument, the people who were intending to do so backed down and actually gave. Though in most cases they paid compensation because the family were unwilling to move back to their land. So we asked payment for such land that had been confiscated. And it, 12 went to litigation out of which 3 were settled out of court. After we went into litigation for virtually similar cases, 
actually it involved also a land racketeering deal. You, you get a land, you demarcate it, and you sell it to people. The land, then the same land is sold to someone who has money, and he goes ahead to get a C of O, while the peasants or the less privileged are just trying to start development, you come and demolish the whole place because the rich have the C of O over the land. And such uh, we are the nature most of the litigation we got. Three actually settled out of court and the people were refunded uh, their money. We obtained judgment for two, which uh, the court gave uh, judgment in favor of uh, our initiative on behalf of the people we are. Five are still in court. Out of the five, one interesting thing is that uh, I just went to Nigeria about three weeks ago. Two actually got judgment, but the most unfortunate thing, and uh, it actually bleeds my heart, is that uh, they got judgment and their money were refunded, but the trial judge actually took the money away. <laughs> and so it's still another case. Believe me, I know a letter just opened. The trial judge just converted their money to the... Because actually I wasn't around on ground in Kaduna. So when the judgment was passed, the, the procedure was for them to give the court the money and the court will pass the money to the rightful owner. The, they actually brought the money to the court and, uh, you know, because of illiteracy, we were, I wasn't on ground to make sure things go further. By the time I went back, and was challenging the case, the trial judge had converted the money to his personal use. And uh, hopefully by September, I hope to go back to see how I could pursue. One of the cases we actually lost, it's, it's a widow, she died on the process, and uh, we're still looking, she, she, she doesn't have uh, any mail for now, but we're still fighting her case because she lost her life in a car accident while coming to the case, and the case was a bit stalled. Uh, part of the work we do include advocacy, empowerment, enlightenment, sensitization, medi mediation, and as a last resort, we go to litigation. For now, we actually <coughs> extracted pictures because they are current pictures, and for security reasons, we just extracted it because we had that this will be streamed live and we didn't want to stream people's picture without actually seeking their consent and all that. So we actually extracted that we sensitize the communities and we try to pressure government into giving, uh, recognizing the rights of uh, occupants, whether they actually have certificate of occupancy or not. We collaborate recently, we had written to Legal Aid Council because the cost of litigation is actually getting out of hand and the initiative is actually funded from our personal pockets. And so we are already in talk with the Legal Aid Council in Nigeria and Human Rights Commission in order to see how we collaborate and fight this common injustice. Pressuring local government and state government to tax land. We believe that uh, if land is being taxed, it will serve an, as an incentive not to hold large parcels of land for speculative reasons and all the rest. We also pressure in local government to create land records. At least if you have an established land record, it will be difficult for such injustice to be practiced and to give recognition to other forms of rights over land to ensure security of tenure. At least those who have lived in the land for the, as long as they knew should be have a other form of security over such land. You can't just come and evict a person who throughout his life has lived in such parcel of land overnight and where you ask him to go. And you call him settler or migrant, so you discriminate against him. Next slide. So I saw Elena checking her time. Uh, the challenges and prospects, we have very low level of literacy because a lot of people are quite uneducated even though they have actual uh, rights over land they don't know, even where it exists. They, they hardly fight for it. They get scared going to court. Mm -hmm. In most cases, when you said, let's go to court, they say, no, 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 we don't want to go to court. Because we, they just believe going to court means uh, the closest way to get to jail. 
<laughs> fear and threats to life. A lot of time you get threats and you get fear. You uh, force most less privileged people to abandon their land. Sometimes this threat comes in the form of uh, very close loved ones will be threatened. And because of fear of that, a lot of people say no. I prefer my land to uh, my life to the land, so I won't go to court and I won't fight over it. They tell you that as long as we have life, we have hope. Uh, one other challenge we have is capacity building. Uh, for most of us, we are like uh, personally, I'm not an expert in land tenure system, and most time I find it difficult. It was uh, it's during this type of forum I get to know better. And I think we need capacity building for the executives of the initiatives. The NGO needs for that capacity to cope with demand. Demand still exists. There is quite large demand, but uh, because we lack capacity to handle such, we <coughs> mostly refer them to other NGOs, if possible. And because we are close to the people, most of the time they prefer us to handle their case. If land is tax appropriate, it would create the incentive not to acquire whole land. Given legal value to order, which uh, I have discussed, uh, for lack of time, I'll call my big brother, Lucas Achi, to come and take over from here. I hope I didn't bore you. Continue. <laughs> well, I hope I won't take too much time. It's, it's just a continuation of what he has said, and so that I don't react to just two or three more slides will be done. Next one, please. Now, mine is also to indicate a similar thing, but when I moved to Abuja, which is the federal capital, the problem was slightly different. Here, the federal government had said, this territory is now everybody's land. That is, every Nigerian is entitled to that place. And then the question was, what do you do with the settlers who were originally there? The concept from the beginning was, take them out. <laughs> and uh, put them in other states. But halfway through the project, the government said, no, it's too expensive, just allow them to stay. But we'll resettle them in other parts of the, you know, of the territory. But that didn't work. So the question is that as soon as the development begins to reach such settlements, they say, OK, please move. And they ask, where to? You've not resettled us. And they say, just move. The law says, go. So we started getting cases of what do they do. Sometimes you have the bulldozers going through. I was privileged to work there from 2005, where at a stage I had to like abandon the bulldozer and say, well, I'm not going to do this. Because we came to a house, and a small kid was crying. The mother was not there. The father was not there. They had gone to farm. And here was the government bulldozer ready to remove the building. And I felt it's not right. That was like the turning point. And we had a long brush with the minister, and I said, I don't think it's right. The way you are going about this is not right. You have to remove these people first. Give them some other alternative before you can do what you want to do. Otherwise, you don't have any moral rights. It's after debate, and I was almost sacked, but it created a situation where we had to hold a meeting. And I think it's at that meeting that a committee was set up. I'll give you a slide that shows what government thought of. But I think it did work. And since then, wherever there are settlements found, they allow them to wait until a solution is found. Meanwhile, as that is happening, you know, they keep growing. For the past 30 years now, you don't expect the same family to be the same five. So the children marry, and you know, we breed like rats sometimes. So you have so many children, each person wants his own right. And luckily for most of these children, they've gone to school. And most of them I realized, oh, we have some rights. We didn't realize. So part of our sensitization is to make them see what roles they can play in ensuring that their rights are protected. Luckily, the past election, the senator in charge of the whole federal capital is an indigent. And so he has now created a new platform for them in the National Assembly to say, well, look, we need certain things done for us. So if the budget goes there, they say, well, where is the budget for the resettlement? Why are you taking my people? What are you doing with this? What are you doing with that? That has become a major front, and I think it is helping us too in some of the cases. And we're lucky in the... I won't read all this, so let's just keep going. Next slide, please. We were able to get two, three cases accepted by government. The settlers that are there, 
have said, look, we are ready to, to stay here. We don't want to move. So our initiative said, okay, we can assist as consultants to do an upgrading exercise for them where they will participate. They will know exactly what needs to be done, what are their requirements, so that we can get some resolution rather than moving, moving them out. And that has worked. We're still waiting for some few more funds, but we've already done all the designs. Done the, I have the project I can give to Elena, the whole project itself from beginning to the end. We have some little funding also from the UN, uh, UN Habitat on this particular project because they felt it was a good thing to do. Rather than throw them out, how do you improve their livelihood so that they become part of the same Nigeria that everybody claims? Next one, please. Good. I've brought this up for those who are academicians, just to tax you. But essentially, when we held the discussion with the minister and all those who are relevant in making Abuja what it should be, we said, well, look, we need to reinvent the FCT. And they said, okay, let's see. So in all the discussion, I decided to like, summarize what they said. They had a 12-month a, a program. The first three months, that's the first line. Anything you see there is like captured the things that the government wants to do or should do. The next six months, the same stuff inside is what the government said they would do. And finally up to the 12th month. But then, if you look at the scale on the right hand side, the higher the item on the top, the better the impact for the, pop, for the, for the community. The lower, of course, is like, well, I'll wait forever till something comes up. But then this like captured their vision of what to do for the city to ensure that people got the right thing. And I think topmost there was the issue of resettlement. Because there's the first item there, quick yeah. wings. There has to be resettlement because you don't do anything else if you don't resettle these people. And they accepted that. And I felt that was a good, uh, well, of course, I'm referring to the controversial minister, Erufai, who was instrumental to my moving to Abuja to work with him because he said most of those at a certain level were corrupt so he was looking for Nigerians that he felt could do the work that's how I got there anyway otherwise we were struggling with uh, Daniel in Kaduna Polytechnic teaching and then doing lots of this social work but then when he requested for that and the planning agency I mean the planning institute said well we have somebody there uh, and so I moved there and we started the discussions on how best to. And I think that's why he accepted. Twice or three times we had serious dispute with him, but he accepted because he reasons and he looks at what you've said. He would take a decision and I say, no, it's not right. Now that's what we don't have in the whole social realm of our leaders. They don't listen. And they think that they can do whatever they want because the power is in their hand. But in him, I think we were privileged to get someone who was ready to listen to you and you call other directors and all other heads of units and say well let's listen to Soso but he has a point we debate and we finally find a solution to how best to go about it at a stage most of uh, I know the funds for social and health I think I mean some of their budget had to be transferred just for the resettlement at one of the arguments over 300 million in one quarter, because every month before we allocate funds, we all have to sit and decide, okay, this is what is coming in. How do we use this amount of money? That's the privilege he gave us when we started. But of course, thank God I retired after the others came, because we kept fighting over one thing or the other, and I felt I've had enough. So I left two years ago, and I'm now working as a consultant, I'm working with these groups. So can I have the last slide? Good. No matter what the challenge is. <laughs> If the toad gives up, he will be swallowed. <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, if the what's the name of this uh, little bird? <laughs> if it gives up, he will be he you know, will be squeezed to death. So I think that is the emphasis we have now. Now look, never, never give up, because like we have the cases in Kaduna, don't give up because we are going to court. Don't give up because someone is threatening you. There are rights we need to follow them, even where we have issues that needs to be sorted out, we can always find a solution. Thank you very much. I just want uh, Amir and the two of you to stand up for just a minute, Daniel.
and then we, I, I just want to honor you guys as the high-minded, moral, strong, courageous, beautiful new leadership coming out of Africa. More power to you. Yeah. Yes, my question is, you know, when you talk about this uh, uh, eviction of people uh, for the resettlement, what, I, I couldn't quite understand why it needed that. Was it to eventually, in your mind, mm. to bring in people who were, uh, certainly it was, a, it seemed to me almost like a <coughs> ethnic cleansing, if you can take it that way, so that they can get people who were uh, uh, people to live in the federal capital city who were uh, pro the government or anything like that. Was that the reason? Why, why was that? Well, no, I didn't do that. Not exactly. The, okay, sure. the initial concept was that the when we decided to move the federal capital from Lagos, for whatever reasons we had, first, we felt it should be a space for everybody in the country to have a say. Yes. And the master plan that was prepared considered that there would be nothing on the ground in terms of settlements. So all existing uh, settlements were supposed to initially to be moved out. But the movement from Lagos did not wait for that because it was during the military period. So at one of the stages when the, it was Babangida then, who had, there was an attempted coup. So he felt Lagos wasn't safe. So he initiated the movement to Abuja faster than was initially designed. So the first settlers came in when there were still other communities that had not been moved out. So it wasn't that they, they didn't want anybody initially, but they just said, well, look, if you want to have a good design, let's have these people off. And I thought it was poor planning, because I would have thought, whatever you find, you should make the best use of it. And that's why we were encouraging that we need to do a bit of integration, because they are also human beings, they are settlements. And there's the, the initial place called Garki, the initial village that existed where the main city started. We have an interesting situation now, and they are saying they are not moving. Make us part of the cultural heritage of the city which I think is a point, yeah. rather than bulldozing it and allocating it to somebody else to build something else. Why don't you maintain the initial character? It's not more than a, uh, two hectares total area. It's very interesting. And I thought that should be something we should encourage. Yeah. Let people come here and see. This is where it started. So I think, I hope it answers your question. No. Oh, well. Oh, you want to add? Well, all right. I'll add one more. Maybe he's here? Maybe you can come up. Okay. What are the mechanisms that you are having in place in order to avoid uh, the operation of uh, corruptions in all this process? Okay. Three things we have thought of. First, we are still relying on the legal backing. Of course, as you heard, it, it also has its own problems. But the biggest thing is to have proper records. We're lucky that uh, the geographical system has just been introduced in certain parts of the city. But in Abuja, we already have that the Abuja Geographical Information System that maps, it was done by the Germans through Bega, uh, Julius Bega. They have mapped every square inch of the land. They are now trying to match that with who owns it so that we can have that record that can be kept anywhere, both in the archives, so that if anything happens, you can always trace the thing. But the second mechanism is this information, because lots of people are being fed with the wrong information. Lots of them also are like kept outside the knowledge of what they should have as rights. For instance, the law says you can apply and get a piece of land. 
But you are made to think that, no, it's not only, I have to be very rich, I have to be educated, I don't even know how to fill the forms. Or you must, and nobody tells you what to do, so you are like confused. And each time you make a, a submission and it is not properly done, nobody even listens to you, nobody even replies to you, not to know, even for you to know whether I did the right thing or not. So it takes, again, only the privileged few to know what to do. And that is becoming a problem. And I think the third one we're trying to do is to see, if, okay, is to get to the National Assembly and get some law passed that can protect them. Do you want to add something? Mm -hmm. so okay. Just one more minute. Just one more minute. We'll have hour. Okay. So keep it one more minute. Okay. Uh, okay, another thing we do is true lobbying. You, you, uh, formerly we thought that uh, since the politicians are all corrupt, we should avoid them. We now understand we can't fight from outside, we have to be inside. Yeah, and so we are lobbying some, we still have some who have integrity, who could listen. We're still looking at uh, maybe in future trying to get people to run for political office that are members or that sympathize with what we are actually doing. Yes, and I think we exploit the professionals in the, in the, the National Assembly, seven. like the architects, the planners, quantity surveyors that are there. That we so look, you're part of us. Do something. <laughs> yes.